directly and lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil, and resembling in the pleated watery wrinkles bordering it, the polished metallic-like marks of some swift tide rip at the mouth of a deep, rapid stream. All sail being set, he now cast loose the lifeline, reserved for swaying him to the main royal masthead, and in a few moments they were hoisting him thither, when, while but two-thirds of the way aloft, and while peering ahead through the horizontal vacancy between the main topsail and top gallant sail, he raised a gull-like cry in the air. There she blows! There she blows! Fired by the cry, which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on deck rushed to the rigging to behold the famous whale they had so long been pursuing. Like noiseless, nautilus shells, their light prows sped through the sea, but only slowly they neared the foe. As they neared him, the ocean grew still more smooth, seemed drawing a carpet over its waves, seemed a noon meadow, so serenely it spread. At length, the breathless hunter came so nigh his seemingly unsuspecting prey that his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible, sliding along the sea as if an isolated thing, and continually set in a revolving ring of finest, fleecy, greenish foam. He saw the vast, involved wrinkles of the slightly projecting head beyond. Before it, Far out on the soft, Turkish-rugged waters went the glistening white shadow from his broad, milky forehead, a musical rippling playfully accompanying the shade. And behind, the blue waters interchangeably flowed over into the moving valley of his steady wake. And on either hand, bright bubbles arose and danced by his side. But these were broken again by the light toes of hundreds of gay fowl softly feathering the sea alternate with their fitful flight, and like to some flagstaff rising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back, and at intervals one of the cloud of soft-toed fowls hovering, and to and fro skimming like a canopy over the fish, silently perched and rocked on this pole, the long tail feathers streaming like pennons. A gentle joyousness, a mighty mildness of repose in swiftness, invested the gliding whale. Not the white bull Jupiter, swimming away with ravished Europa clinging to his graceful horns, his lovely leering eyes sideways intent upon the maid, with smooth bewitching fleetness, rippling straight for the nuptial bower in Crete, not Jove, not that great majesty supreme, did surpass the glorified white whale as he so divinely swam. Calm, enticing calm, O whale, thou glidest on to all who for the first time eye thee, no matter how many in that same way thou mayst have bejuggled and destroyed before. But soon the forepart of him slowly rose from the water, for an instant, his whole marbleized body formed a high arch like Virginia's natural bridge, and warningly waving his bannered flukes in the air, the grand god revealed himself, sounded, and went out of sight. Hoveringly halting and dipping on the wing, the white sea fowls longingly lingered over the agitated pool that he left. With oars apeak and paddles down, the sheets of their sails adrift, the three boats now stilly floated, awaiting Moby Dick's reappearance. The breeze now freshened. The sea began to swell. In long Indian file, as when herons take wing, the white birds were now all flying towards Ahab's boat. And when, within a few yards, began fluttering over the water there, wheeling round and round with joyous expectant cries, their vision was keener than man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea. But suddenly, as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot, no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising and magnifying as it rose till it turned 
and then there were plainly revealed two long crooked rows of white glistening teeth floating up from the undiscoverable bottom.